Welcome back, WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are positively into that slow period around here for sports. We're not ready for baseball yet and certainly gives me a chance to stretch out a little bit here. We are going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour, taking it back out on the road beginning on March 3rd. We're going to be at Drug City in Dundalk. I have my uh, my dear, dear middle school music professor, Calvin Statham and the Statham Singers, going to be joining us in Dundalk. It's all brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Window Nation. I want to remind everybody, Windows available, 866-90-NATION, buy two, get two free. And two years free financing at Window Nation. I've been saving some dough and staying a little warmer here this winter through our friends at Window Nation. We're also on the 8th of March, going to be at Fadley's at Lexington Market, eating those delicious crab cakes, perhaps for the last time in the old market. So we're looking forward to that. And then... In the middle of March, right there about the time everybody's beer gets green and they're doing St. Patrick's Day, we have an a, amazing symposium. Every single year, I, I try to bring on whoever the Loyola University Center for the Humanities is going to be bringing in. This year, it's award-winning novelist Julie Atsuka. Uh, she is here to discuss her book and her memories of uh, a Japanese intern camp, a book that she wrote 20 years ago that has become somehow – controversial welcome to america i would say <laughs> julie a pleasure to have you on uh congratulations on all your success and on having books banned it tells me that you're doing things the right way and have always done things the right way here in america and you're coming here to talk about this welcome in uh, a, a pleasure to have an author on a real writer on thanks mister it's great to be here well, you go around the country and have to speak about banning and censorship and uh and and the topicality of your first book has become something that people talk about and people bring you in from far away uh, to come in and, and, and chat with kids. And more than that, this is part of an educational uh, a, a structure for, for kids to read and learn what our country did almost 100 years ago. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know more about this than I do. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about what you're going to be discussing on March 16th when you come here to beautiful Baltimore over at Loyola campus. Yeah, I'll probably start by talking about my mother and her family. So they were incarcerated after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And this is a story that I didn't really know very much about as a child growing up, which is very typical, I think, in Japanese American families. The incarceration just was not spoken about. So I think I came to writing because of the silence in my own family about this episode in our history. And it was a way of learning about my mother. She was 10 when the war broke out, World War II. And she was imprisoned in a concentration camp called Topaz in Utah in the middle of the desert. It's a very, very desolate area for three and a half years. And her father was arrested uh, by the FBI the day after Pearl Harbor was bombed as a suspected spy for Japan. Um, so I think I'm just going to begin just simply by just telling my own very, very personal family story. That will be the starting point. That's an amazing journey. You know, my, I think we all, once we get to be a certain age, we try to learn a little bit about our lineage, lineage or heritage, even if we were not raised. I was born Venezuelan. I was certainly not raised in any Venezuelan culture, uh, but familiar with some of my family's history. I spent last week with my 81-year-old aunt in Houston asking her, how did I get here? in the 1960s. And I learned things, right? And I don't know why I've never asked my 81-year-old Venezuelan aunt how she wound up here. Um, and But I guess it took me to be 54 years of age to literally do this last week. And I went on uh, a mission. It involved Bruce Springsteen. I, I got a full admission. Bruce Springsteen was in Houston, but I had never asked my aunt. And over pancakes and waffles last Tuesday, uh, we actually had a chat about how we wound up here. You mentioned in Japanese culture, and I've been to Japan a few times. I love Japanese culture. I love Tokyo. Um, saving face is probably the first thing any uh, <laughs> American or, you know, Western culture person would read about anyone going to Asia is saving face and pride and family pride. And you said to me, we just didn't talk about those things. And I'm thinking false pride involves a lot of things. Did can you discuss why those things weren't talked about? And you use the word. We call them internment camps here because it's pleasant. You call it concentration camp. Um, that's not a word that Americans have used to discuss that in 80 years, have they? Actually, it is. It's the word that Franklin Roosevelt used to describe the camps. It's how the camps were described in the newspapers at the time. 
Um, so well, we've lost that in translation. Oh, haven't we? we definitely have. Yeah. Um, but that is how they were referred to in, you know, in the early 1940s. So that's why I use that word and not to get too technical, but internment actually applies to people only to people who were not born in this country. So two thirds of the Japanese Americans were born, who, who were incarcerated in the camps were born in this country. So they were American. Your mother was born here, but was 10? Correct. 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 Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now her father was born in Japan, correct? He was in Japanese by law, were not allowed to become American citizens. So he- Prior to the bombing. Correct. Really? Really. Special they, for Japanese. Obviously, my Venezuelan family came in the 60s, so different. But every family I grew up with in East Baltimore, Polish, German, Italian, they all came. They all came through. I, I, I think Ellis Island or like that. Baltimore was also a place where, where boats came from Europe. Um, and I've uh -huh. since learned a lot about slavery and a lot of a lot of things on Baltimore positive, not all of it positive, quite frankly, but all of it true and all of it things that I think we need to talk about and certainly something that you felt like you needed to talk about a uh, quarter century ago and in, in, in writing a book in terms of what that life was like for your family, right? Yeah. And I wanted to mention to your point about asking questions. I wish I'd asked my questions, you know, decades earlier, because by the time I began to write my novel, my mother, who I thought would be a great source of information. And basically she was, but she was in the very, early stages of dementia. So she was no longer a completely reliable source of information. But because with dementia, you you lose your childhood memories last. So her memories of being a child in the camps were still very, very, very clear. Um, but there is still so much that I'll never know about what happened. Um, I did learn a lot, but I had to do a lot more research than I thought I would. I couldn't just rely on my family for their stories. But um, one thing, when the book came out, there were still so many survivors of the camps alive, including my mother. And now 20 years later, you know, most of those folks are gone. And they, like you said, it's the Japanese culture is very much about saving face. And a lot of the Japanese Americans felt shame, which they should not have felt, but they somehow felt that it was their own fault that they had been sent away to the camps. And afterwards, they just did not want to talk about it at all. Um, as a friend of mine said, he said, well, we're not whiners. <laughs> so um, they just wanted to pick up the pieces of their lives and just move on as best they could. So, you know, that's why I didn't grow up speaking Japanese at home, even though it was my mother's first language. My father actually was an immigrant from Japan, but we only spoke English. Um, we had, there was, I think we had one Japanese face in the house. There was just really nothing Japanese at all. And that was very typical of third generation Japanese Americans like myself to grow up in these households that were completely cleansed of anything vaguely Japanese because our parents, after having gone through the war, one wanted us to be as American as possible, which is why my name is Julie, <laughs> because my parents, uh, when my mother was pregnant, they looked at the name your baby book and they just chose the, you know, one of the most popular names for girls. They really wanted me to blend in. Well, I'm glad you blent in. I'm glad you speak English and write in English because I still read in English. Julie Atsuka is a, a Guggenheim Fellowship a recipient. Uh, she has written things and been awarded things, and she's coming to town to uh, speak on behalf of Loyola University and the Center uh, for the Humanities. Uh, their annual keynote address, and they do this every year. This year it's on Thursday, March 16th at 6.30. It's right in McGuire Hall. Julie will be in discussing an American story, war memory, and erasure about her family's experience in Japanese internment camps or concentration camps. Uh, and I, your book was written in 2002. The book is When the Emperor Was Divine. You mentioned 20 years ago and your mother and the last 20 years that have passed. You write this book, you get awarded. Um, it just an, an amazing, probably changed your life dramatically at that time. I would think that you, that because of the topicality, maybe along the lines, you did run into other people who were not suffering from dementia to, to talk to you about it. Or did the book not open any door anywhere to have more conversations, to learn more about the subject matter? Oh, no, I feel very fortunate in that 
when I was on book tour for Umber 20 years ago, I traveled up and down the West Coast, which is where most of the Japanese Americans live. And, um, you know, I didn't grow up in a Japanese American community. This is back in the 60s. So there just there weren't a lot of people who looked like me when I was I, I grew up in Palo Alto. And um, well, you're just a California girl in your own mind. Right. Northern, <laughs> right. I mean, literally. Right? I think you can hear the Valley Girl accent if you listen really hard. Um, <laughs> um, but. You know, I was able to speak to people who had lived through the camps and they just started telling me their family stories after my readings, they would come up to me. And that's actually where I got the idea for my second novel, The Buddha in the Attic, which is about Japanese picture brides, basically mail order brides who came over from Japan to America in the 1920s. And um, I would just, women would come up to me and say, you know, my my mother or my grandmother came over as a picture bride. And when she got off the boat, she was shocked to learn that her husband was so old or so poor or so dark. Like these men had misrepresented themselves in photographs and letters. So, and these women had come, you know, across an ocean to marry these men that they did not know. And it was just a really fascinating story. And that, so I just kind of, you know, I just absorbed these stories that people told me and I use them in my next novel. You've been to Japan. You have probably been there more times than I have been there. I've been there only twice, and it's been a long time since I've I been there, there twice, and I can't wait to go back the third time. So uh, <laughs> uh, they, what was your experience there? It was amazing. It's, it was many years ago, and I got to meet – I I didn't – like I said, I did not grow up speaking Japanese, but I studied it for one year in college intensively. Boy, that language is very hard for a native English speaker. I'm just but glad I learned chopsticks. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I you know, konnichiwa and, and, you know, arigato and – you know, I, I do use chopsticks actually. I'm missing yeah. a finger. So I went over in 2006. It was actually in China that uh -huh. they brought me toothpicks to eat. And I said to myself, you know, I I've, I've adapted in life. I've learned how to throw a curveball with a missing finger. I need to learn chopsticks. So once I learned chopsticks, it opened the whole door for me. And I feel like if you can throw a curveball, you can use chopsticks. It is the great accomplishment of my adulthood. At over 40, the biggest accomplishment is learning to eat with chopsticks. So it's good. Now try it in your other hand. No. <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> um, but I, I actually, I got to meet my father's relatives. So he grew up in this very tiny, tiny village. It was basically a silkworm village about 60 miles outside of Tokyo. So it was just, it was this tiny place in the mountains. And um, so you I, sought your heritage. You did go and you went I, down that path. I did. And they did not speak any English. And my father was an only child, but he did have relatives in this town still. And so I remember going into his uncle's house and the entire second floor was filled with silkworms, these trays of silkworms. And it was just wild. Um, it was just like stepping back in time. And just to think that, you know, my father, I was, I just like, you know, he really has, you know, he crossed a great ocean, you know, he really, it was just, it, I, you just realize how far, I realized how far my father had come from this tiny village in the middle of nowhere to come to America. It was just, I think it was a pretty brave thing to do, but your immigrants, your, your family too. I mean, it just, it's brave to up and leave and to go to a culture where, you know, you look different, perhaps you don't speak the language. You'll always have an accent. You might not be accepted. You'll always be perhaps a foreigner, um, and yet, you know, but to meet the people, you know, from whom he came was, it was quite something. And I could speak, you know, I could speak enough. We could communicate. So that, that, I mean, and now I would not be able to, I've, I've lost most of my Japanese, but that was really a kind of a stunning experience. Julia Tsuka, author. She will be here in Baltimore on March 16th. You can follow her out on the interwebs and look her up and read her books. Uh, and in some places, you're not allowed to read her books. Which, So, Julia, I, I've been a writer my whole life. I was a journalist in the 80s, newspaper reporter. Uh, I've done radio for 31 years. I've written a couple of books. The books I've written have been sports-related around championships. So one of the more disturbing events of my life that I – and I talk about this openly with any writer and I have a lot of writers on because I like smart people. Um, not, not all Yale fellows, but some of them are. Yeah. Um, um, but in 2014, the Ravens won the Super Bowl almost 10 years ago. And you know, the Internet's mature and there's a Facebook and a Twitter and like all of that. I wrote a nice thick book with a little bit of a fairy tale cartoon cover about the Ravens second championship. 
and it was third person. And I, I dove in and I learned stories from the quarterback. I was so proud of it. I took 200 days of my life writing this thick book, selling it for 30 bucks to Ravens fans all over the world, taking orders. I went to Ocean City, Maryland, uh, second week of June after this, and I had a bunch of books, and it was like the convention for the fans. And I had the books stacked up and the posters and signing books and it's all nice, except I sat there and watched thousands of people walk by me, all with Ravens gear, and they all looked at me, hey, Nestor, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm good, book. I don't read new books. I ain't read new books in years. And I sat there for, you know, two days and I sold you know, 20 books or whatever, because these 10,000 people who love the Ravens, whose basements are purple, everything's purple. They, they didn't read no books. And this really concerned me. And then two years later, Donald Trump became, pre- we can go on and on and on and on. Uh, as for the deterioration of all of that, I am, anytime I bring an author on, I have a lot of sports author friends who write great, great books, bestsellers, the whole deal. I always worry about <laughs> all of us who write books and where the audience is. And then I worry even more when I have someone like you on who has been put in this situation to see your own book burned. Um, I, I want you to talk about Wisconsin and talk about book banning and being an author and the importance of the material, any material that can open people's minds and hearts to some degree. Um, I, I'm, I'm very discouraged about books and banning, and uh, it's an honor to have you on to talk about having your book banned. I said that in the beginning, and I mean it. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a shock after 20 years of just being out there talking about the book. Um, to encounter pushback. This had just never happened to me before. Um, But it was an unusual and ultimately unexpectedly heartening story. So this was a ban that was started not by, most book bans are started by parents in the community, but this ban was initiated by several members of the school board in Muskego. And they rejected my book. It's a little unclear, but their official reasons were that it was too sad. It was too poetic. And they wanted to show an American point of view. Um, and I'm an American author. <laughs> People that I'm writing about are Americans. Um, so, but, so the book was rejected by the school board after the English teachers in the district had proposed the use of this book. Um, however, the- parents- In the same way that that I read Catcher in the Rye and East of Eden, in, in that, what, what, type of children would be reading your book a age group not that it matters but wh- who this did they book, want to keep it away from that's what i'm trying it, to understand it was, i think it was a 10th grade ap english class i mean that's catcher in the rye as the, miss monday was my 10th grade teacher and i still <laughs> friends with her and we talk about catcher in the rye every time we get together <laughs> and, you know and that's it's it's you know kids are smarter than we give them credit for being they can handle difficult material but the parents in the community rallied against the ban and this is a, it's a fairly conservative town, but it was an amazing thing to watch. They were, um, they were not happy with the ban. They started a petition, 300 people signed it. There was a rally. People came out in opposition to the ban in support of the book. Um, they formed a book club, a community book club. And the first book that they read was When the Emperor Was Divine. <laughs> um, it ended up being a real, I mean, ultimately the book was, it was rejected. It will not be taught you know, next year in the high schools um, in Muskego. But- um, Maybe one day though. Perhaps. Huh? <laughs> you don't know, but I had never seen a community rally like that around a book and that gave me hope. And some of the people at the rallies were former high school students um, at this school that had banned the book and former teachers. So it was It was in the end, It was. it, it was a very heartening thing to see, I have to say. Well, I hope everybody comes out and joins you on March 16th, celebrates your book and uh, and honors your story and uh, and and the meaning and the deeper meaning of all of it. I guess this is why you want 10th grade kids writing term papers about such things uh, and taking it in. And speaking to the sadness and and I don't read a whole lot of fiction. I'm a nonfiction reader. Uh, full disclosure, I'm that guy. Um, but but sadness and inviting that in and inviting a story. My, my wife is a reads fiction and she started reading again recently and i don't know why she picks the book she reads or you know or what the hook would be or what what the story would be but the the notion that you're writing books and you 
You wrote them 25 years ago. What makes a good book these days? I mean, when you're writing a book, you want an audience, you want to sell it, but you also want to write your own book. It's sort of like being an artist or being a musician or being anything else where you're making things, hoping that to have success to feed yourself, but also understanding that you're not writing for everybody. You can't have a happy ending to a sad book, right? No, you know, it's funny. People ask me like, who is your audience? And actually my audience is just myself when I'm writing. I'm really writing for my ear, just for the sound of the language. And I just hope that what I'm thinking about will appeal to somebody out there. You have no idea as a writer if your book will find an audience or not, but I think you can't really worry about it. I think you have to tell the story that you're really dying to tell. Um, and, you know, if it finds a home, great, but, um, so that, that's how I work. If I, I think if I worried about an audience or people liking or not liking my book, that might be a little debilitating <laughs> just psychologically to worry about, will people like it or not? Will it find a publisher or not? Um, I think as a writer, you know, your job is just to write the best book that you can. The books I've written have be, been very much Jack Torrance shining back in a room, all work and no play. It, it <laughs> is it is a solitary for for an extrovert, for a born extrovert. It is an incredibly solitary thing to be a writer. It really is. Yeah. And I would have to say also, you said it took you 200 days. That is lightning fast. Oh, yeah. I had to get it out. Oh. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I know that. Real writers, and when I have them on, they're in year three or year four of the project, right? Literally, that would be the middle of a book for me. Um, so why does but, it take you so long to bake the cake? You know, every writer is different. I just happen to be a slow writer, and I'm very, I'm just a perfectionist. My sentences have to sound right. I also do a lot of research for my novels. Um, and if you're writing historical fiction, you really have to get your facts right because somebody will call you on it if you don't. And if you're a reader and you're and you're reading along and you you run across something that you know is not accurate, it just breaks the spell of the novel. Um, so so there's that. So there's the research and then there's the actual writing process. I I, I think. I probably throw out 99% of what I write. Um, so it just takes me a while to kind of get to the heart of the story. And I I'm, I guess I'm sort of a minimalist by nature. So I, I start with a lot of material and I just kind of pare down and pare down and pare down. And it just takes me a long time. What's next? <laughs> Actually, it, it's completely different um, from what I've written in the past, but I'm working on an essay about the painter Joan Mitchell. Do you know who she is? No. She, well, she was, um, I'll tell you, she was a second generation abstract expressionist painter. Um, and she uh, is just, I, I, I love her work so much. Um, she's, I think, recently become more well known for her work. Um, but she was, she was, she, she was big in the 1950s. Um, she lived the last 30 years of her life in France. But um, I, my training is as a painter. I studied painting and sculpture for many years before I began to write. Um, I came to writing after having failed at painting, which was my great first love. Um, you can't but, fail at painting. It's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> it's very easy. I did it, <laughs> believe me. But so I've never, it's, it's, I've never written nonfiction. So it's very interesting to be writing about something that's um, not related to my family's past at all. That's not fictional at all. It's something external. It's something that I'm looking at. I get to use my visual way of thinking, which I love. Um, I get to think about color and I, I love paint. I love color. And so um, it's been really fun actually to work on this essay. And I have a deadline, which means that I can't just- Gotta take... get it done. Yes. So, <laughs> um, which, you know, when somebody puts the fire under you, it's actually, it can be a good thing. So you're going to go from artist to writer to journalist here with a real deadline, you know, to get this thing published. <laughs> Julie Atsuka joins us. Uh, she will be in Baltimore uh, in, in Loyola, and we'll make sure she doesn't have any tourist crab cakes on the 16th of March. Uh, she'll be at McGuire Hall at Loyola discussing and uh, doing something they annually do. It's a Center for Humanities. They do an annual symposium. Uh, this year, she's going to deliver the keynote address, an American story, war, memory, and erasure about her family's experience in the Japanese internment camps concentration camps, World War II. Uh, and uh, you can learn more at aloyola.edu. You can learn more at a Baltimore Positive. And where should I tell people to follow you and find your uh, your books anywhere they're sold other than how to spell your name, O-T-S-U-K-A. And it's not even the Japanese pronunciation. So you're going to help me with that before you go, right? 
I will try. Um, my pronunciation probably is not great, but it's Otska is the correct Japanese pronunciation. So See, if that I'm, almost sounds like my wife's Polish family right there, like all uh, like this pronunciation a little. What bit. is their What is their name? Uh, well, I mean Snarsky, but like it sounds like uh, because of the way it ends, it has a uh, more of a European flair than I thought, like an Asian funny. flair. But yeah. either way, O T S U K A. You can follow Julie uh, and find her books anywhere the internet is, and certainly follow her here. How many of these do you do on an annual basis? Do you go into a university and talk about your book and talk about your life and your family? You know, it really varies. I mean, it was slow during the first year or two of the pandemic. Um, but I mean, I've had years where I've done, I don't know, 10 or 15, which for me is a lot. And then some years fewer. Um, it, it just, it really, it really depends. Um, I, I can't, there's no way to predict I just like to see authors and book people out and doing things. And every time I drive by something that used to be a bookstore, it worries me. That's all. So uh -huh. uh, I'll just say that for all of us. Uh, and uh, good luck with your nonfiction. I've been working on it all my life. I still haven't gotten it right. I can't do fiction. So uh, <laughs> the left and the right don't work together. But I will see you on March 16th. Uh, congratulations on all your success. And, uh, and I, I love the story. I love having you on. Appreciate the Great. visit. Thanks so much, Nestor. It's been really fun. Juliet Suka, she writes books and things and does art and writes fiction for fiction readers. Go find her and uh, find her on March 16th. Uh, big thanks to Karen Sagal and everyone uh, out there who uh, helps us find great guests and book great guests here at Baltimore Positive. I'm in a little bit of a rest, but we've been doing the Radio Row greatest hits from the last 28 years with Hall of Fame football players, incredible actors and rock stars and all sorts of things. So make sure you're checking that out at a Baltimore Positive as well. We're going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour beginning March 3rd again at Drug City and on the 8th at Fadies. It's all brought to you by the Maryland Lottery and our friends at Window Nation. I am Nestor. We are WNSD, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore Positive.